Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lars Clemenson. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Hampton Bays. I'm glad to see you all, uh, or at least your names. You can see our faces. Uh, we have 58 attendees tonight. Um, and with me uh, on our panel tonight, I have um, Mr. Mike Carlson, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Curriculum and Instruction, Mr. Mark Pagano, who's Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, and Mr. Eric Ferraro, who is our Executive Director for Educational Services. Uh, the, these gentlemen are going to are with me in case number one I go astray, or number two uh, there's a question that they can answer in greater detail. So um, again, thank you for being here. We're going to spend the next bit of time um, going through our reopening plan. So I um, I'll give you a little bit of history on where we are in the timeline. Where is next in the timeline, and then we can dive into what this, the plan to reopen schools in Hampton Bays looks like for the 2021 school year. I'm recording this webinar, so in the next day, as soon as we get that recording back from Zoom, uh, we'll get that on the reopening uh, webs, uh, re the reopening page of hbschools.us. Uh, that page is continually populated with information. We just put up information today regarding uh, contact tracing and COVID testing and what our plan would be um, in the event that we need to activate a COVID test or to begin contact tracing with the Department of Health. Um, by Friday, we'll have a frequently asked questions document that's, that will be up. Um, those documents will be in English and Spanish as well. Um, and then these videos. We have another, list, uh, another presentation on Friday morning. Uh, we had our school board meeting last night at seven o'clock where this presentation was um, also given. And it uh, was similar to the presentation that was given on Friday, July 31st at 8 a.m. So uh, we've tried to vary the amount, the, the times that we've had the, the live sessions to accommodate people's diverse schedules. Um, threading the needle is really the theme of 2021, trying to make it work for everybody. Um, as we begin, um, I'm gonna put a poll up on the screen just to get a sense for who the 79 people are with us. There's a couple of uh, participants via phone you're not going to be able to see that, unfortunately. Um, but take a minute and identify the demographic that you most closely or who you are. Zoom doesn't offer Jeopardy music. All right, very good. So we're roughly a third, a third, a third elementary, middle, high school families. We have a number of families who live in multiple schools. And uh, so I'll start by saying we understand that um, I use the analogy uh, or the, of the, the fairy tale Goldilocks when we were in the 1920 school year quarantine and getting it just right. Um, the plan that we've put forth attempts to do that as well, but at the same time respects how um, vastly different each of our circumstances are, each of our comfort levels are, and each of our um, capacities are um, in households across Hampton Bays to engage in the 2021 school year. So I think by the end of the presentation, um, we'll have painted a, a substantial picture to show how there are options for you and that we're not going to leave anybody behind and as when we put deadlines in place it's so that we can collect as much data as possible um, in a timely manner but we understand that a family might need a little bit more time to make a decision or might want to talk to somebody as well so on july 31st we um oh another another house another housekeeping item um, there are two options that you have on your screen, the Q&A feature and the chat feature. The chat feature, let's reserve for um, chatting. So if you comment or you like something or it's a thumbs up, that's great. Or uh, the Q&A feature, um, use that to type in your questions and they'll, they'll accumulate. 
Um, we are, have one populated already, and we're going to work through them. I may come, I may cover it, and then I'll dismiss the question. I'll go into the dismissed queue, uh, but I may cover it during the presentation. So chat will use informally. The Q and A set this, the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen is what we're going to use to address any questions that you have. On July 31st, uh, we submitted the plan to reopen schools to uh, the state education department and the state department of health. Our understanding upon hitting submission or hitting submit was that we have, um, or, or that we have um, a week following that submission and the governor or his team were, was going to review the plan. When we hit submit, we got an email back instantly that said, for now, assume your plan is approved and keep moving forward. And you'll hear from somebody if there's a problem with it. Then the, you might have seen in the media that a number of districts were not able to submit their plan on time or they did and it went to a different place, you know, bureaucracy at its finest. Um, in that same time and in that news cycle, uh, the Department of Health was working through all the plans. So to this date, we have not received any feedback or correction from the Education Department or the Health Department. So the plan that we submitted on July 31st is just that, a plan. The specifics behind, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, the specifics underneath that plan, you know, what time the lights go on, who's opening the door, how it's all working, some of those decisions have been made and we're going to discuss them tonight. Others are still in development. And I've, I said this in July and I said it last week and I said it today, yesterday and I'm saying it today. Today's August 19th, well, school's starting quickly, but it's also only August 19th and our team's are working seven days a week on, uh, on this issue. So a plan, a specific plan may not be finalized today, but it might be tomorrow, it might be Sunday. Um, and we'll continue to push that information out. On the 31st of July, we had about 150 people participating in viewing the uh, presentation. And in that time, since it's lived on social media, it's been viewed close to 3,000 times, some portion of it. Uh, we also opened our reopening at HB Schools email address, and we've had over 150 individual communication communications with fam with uh, with families, and so we've been engaging in that specific uh, communication as well. That's helped drive the frequently asked questions document. Uh, that's in final edits today, and we're getting that translated into Spanish as well, so that we'll have that up by the end of the week. Um, so that that will also evolve as, as new themes emerge. Um, so tonight, again, presentation of the plan, I'm gonna tackle the questions as they come through, um, or at the end if it's not covered in the presentation. I thank you for participating. Today we have 92 attendees with us. Again, Friday morning at um, 11 a.m. we'll have our um, final presentation of the plan. We do intend to have another opportunity like this um, before school starts because there'll be a lot more specificity to some of the protocols and actual minute by minute operations. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, we'll go through that presentation uh, together. Okay. Okay, so the creation of the plan focused on 12 specific areas, and you can see them in front of you. Essentially, it's keeping uh, students and staff well and making sure that we're checking up on that, making sure that our continuity of learning and education uh, takes place and reaches um, the subgroups uh, that we need to reach. And I can't see the chat right now. Uh, Mr. Ferraro, can you keep an eye on the chat? Or are you able to see that? Okay. Um, and you could flag it if, if there's something we need to address. Um, how we transport kids to and from school, how we maintain our facilities, so that's both cleaning and sanitizing and facility use for groups um, in the community, how we're communicating our information to the community and engaging our stakeholders in the development of the plan, how we're addressing attendance and monitoring attendance, particularly for those kids who might be on the remote model or the hybrid model where certain days they're home, focusing on the social emotional well-being and age appropriate development for our kids. So we can imagine our mind is illustrating to us what we think the classroom is going to look like in September. And 
I understand that there is concern that you, what is a classroom? We've seen it on social media, right? A classroom that has nine desks. And what does that look like? What does that mean? Does my child have to come into the building, get into the classroom, essentially buckle up and just sit down in that desk for the entire day? While that's their home base, we're going to work in opportunities for kids to engage, for kids to move, for kids to um, breathe, for kids to enjoy, to laugh, to enjoy school. So as much as everybody is amped up and anxious about what the school year is going to be, the 2021 school year is going to be loving and it's going to be positive and it's going to be student centered as we make sure um, we make our way carefully, slowly and healthily through the start of the school year to open and most importantly to stay open. Of course, focusing on child nutrition, technology, the digital equity that exists or doesn't exist when we're on the remote model. Our stakeholder advisory task force consisted of representatives from all of the different groups that you see in front of you, administration, uh, faculty, staff, facilities folks, healthcare workers, our parent organizations, transportation organizations, school safety, the Board of Education, um, the Booster Club. We tried to really make a well-rounded think tank to go out and seek feedback from their stakeholders to inform the plan. The governor's guardrails about how we open and stay open and how they're executed in Hampton Bay is look like this. Uh, schools will open in the region if we're in phase four, which we're in phase four, and the daily, the daily infection rate over a 14 day average remains below 5%. Currently, we're at about 1%. So, and lately, we've been even below that. Uh, schools are going to close in the region if on a seven-day average, a tighter time frame, the, the positive infection rate based on the number of tests that were given goes up to 9%. And because that's a seven-day average, we're going to have a sense that something's happening in the region. The governor will close schools in the region. It won't be sub-regional decisions where Nassau can stay open or close and Suffolk has a different plan. The local Department of Health will guide us specifically if a specific school needs to close for a period of time or a specific school district needs to close for a period of time because of an incidence uh, of uh, positive um, infection rate in the community. So if there's what's called a hot spot in Hampton Bays, the Suffolk County Department of Health would say, okay, we're gonna close the schools for a week in order to bring people, get people home and try to stop this hot spot. We saw that in March in Greenport, right? It started at that Greenport Brewing Company and then it went kind of went from there. So the Suffolk County Department of Health will handle what happens within the region. The governor handles what happens to the region as a whole. Our Hampton Bays approach is a phased in one. So we'll get to what the calendar looks like. Many of you, um, many of the names I see participating with us today um, have been engaged. So it's gonna sound familiar to you. There's a couple of changes and evolutions that have been made, but we're gonna begin with a smaller group of students and constantly reassess our capacity to either increase capacity or, or increase enrollment in person or decrease enrollment in person in a regulated way. So we're gonna constantly be looking um, to do that and we can do that in near real time. We understand and appreciate very much and we saw that in the poll of who's in the room with us today. We understand that we can't just make decisions that Monday is going to be one plan, Tuesday is going to be a different plan, and then we're going to switch on Wednesday. And oh, wait, we can go back to Monday again because your households will be everywhere from we've got it under control to sheer chaos, right? And so we respect that. We are a working class community. And so to the extent that we can have our kids in school safely, that's our plan. That said, our ability to eliminate risk doesn't exist. Our ability is to mitigate risk, and we are doing that through careful planning, through following the guidance very carefully and clearly, and making decisions in a conservative way that allow us to make forward progress and not have to retreat. And I need you as families in our community to be ready for anything, even though you might not have to activate a full remote childcare option. But if we end up going full remote, you need to be ready for that. 
If it's 100% in person, that's probably the easiest thing to solve for you as a family. If we're anything in between, I need you to ready yourselves for that. We're having those discussions in my family. I know you're having them in your family as well. And so we're sensitive to um, that every decision we make lands differently on every kitchen table in Hampton Bays. We believe that the phased in approach with smaller groups of students instills confidence in everyone, families, our kids, and our staff who are going to execute these protocols and procedures. It's gonna give us the time and space to master new health and safety protocols together. It's going to also mitigate risk as large groups re-enter the system at one time. We have not all been together since March 13th. So, and we're watching colleges around the country, we're watching Southern schools around the country, and we're learning from their steps and their missteps. We believe that a phased in approach is the responsible way to do this and mitigate risk carefully. We understand that despite our rates being low, they are variable. So we have to, to use Governor Cuomo's valve um, analogy, we have to prepare for those scenarios that demand our fluctuation between um, all the various scenarios. We work from ex expert guidance, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the United States Centers for Disease Control, the New York State Department of Health, the Suffolk County Department of Health, the, Suffolk, uh, the New York State Education Department. So I put on these next two slides and they're posted. And if you've been in these presentations before, you've seen them. The guidance, these are the guardrails. This is the sandbox we basically need to play in in order to construct our plans more, uh, more specifically. At the elementary level the, and middle level, the idea is to cohort classes to reduce mixing and interaction. There are certain instances during the day, K through 12, where mixing is going to happen, but we do it carefully. Um, on school buses, during arrival, um, but for the most part, uh, cohorting of students, at least in the PK through eight um, world, is what's taking place. In nine through 12, that's, that's not possible. Um, face coverings, we understand, are going to be more difficult for younger kids or kids with disabilities, um, but we have a face covering policy um, that is informed very clearly by guidance in all of these. There's no conflicting guidance from these expert organizations about that. Um, desks three to six feet apart. Um, this was a confusing bullet point. And I apologize for that. I got a few questions on it. I only put that on there because that's what the AAP said. State guidance and our plan is six feet of social distancing. So with a, with a face covering and desks six feet apart, individual to individual, that's the belt and suspenders that help ensure a safe environment in the classroom. Um, and then the guidance goes, goes on. I'm not gonna go bullet by bullet because you, it's more important you know what happens in Hampton Bay. It's not what, what these organizations state nationwide. So let's jump to transportation. Um, transportation is a difficult challenge because um, social distancing on a bus is nearly impossible. And um, the, the regulations provide for that. Face coverings will be required on school buses. Social distancing is an aspiration. We're going to do it to the best of our ability. Every bus eligible family received a letter in the mail with a return, self with a, an addressed return with a return address stamped envelope to the school district. We try to remove as many barriers as we can, asking families to opt into transportation. This is like the Greyhound bus or JetBlue. We're going to be reserving seats for students, and so we need to know who intends to ride. Um, that question was asked again on the digital survey that was put out. We're just trying to cast the net in a lot of different buckets to try to get that information. Uh, to the best of our ability, you can see in the top right-hand corner of the slide, uh, that's what the seating would look like. Row one by the window, row two by the aisle, row three window, and so on and so forth. Households can cluster together. So siblings or somebody who lives in the same household can sit in the same seat together. Kids are going to load the bus from the back to the front. That, so that's how the, seat, that's how the seats will be assigned. And then um, in the afternoon, the route will dismiss from the front to the back. So the student at the back seat who was picked up first in the morning will be, picked, will be dropped off last in the afternoon. So that helps the flow on the bus. 
Buses will be sanitized and cleaned um, every day and in between trips, wiped down with sanitizing wipes, belts, and high touch areas like the bars. Windows will be open and seats. Windows will be open one inch and the roof hatches will be popped uh, so long as the outside temperature remains above 45 degrees. Um, we are not able to deny anyone transportation. So a stock of disposable masks will be on each bus, but we really need students to be wearing their own masks. Um, the school district will provide one mask for every individual in the school district. It is a cloth reusable washable mask and it'll either be purple or white, our school colors, but that will help determine which team you're on. You're on the um, purple hybrid team or the white hybrid team. And that determines what days you go to school. That's what your color, um, that's the uh, mask you'll have. Of course, if that mask is not ultimately comfortable for you or you have a preferred mask at home or one that is stylish to your style, um, you can wear a mask of your own as well, but we will provide one for everybody. Um, our drivers will um, follow the same protocols as staff and wear face coverings, conduct daily health screenings, they'll have their temperatures taken before they begin their shift. Um, there is a bus disinfecting and sanitizing video on our website, so you can visit that and go to the transportation page, and there's a 45-second video that just illustrates how our drivers um, and Montauk bus will be making sure our buses are clean each day. Cleaning and sanitizing, the, the materials that we use to clean and sanitize the buildings are on EPA and State Education Department approved lists for cleaning. Um, the guidance uh, requires that we do not use uh, chemicals and uh, or harmful or hazardous chemicals that might solve the COVID problem, but create other irritants or other problems like um, other aspirational problems. Um, asthmatic problems or breathing respiratory issues. So Clorox is not going to be used, for example. Um, we are using a BioShield, which is an antimicrobial, which is a cleaner that has an antimicrobial protection. We'll put all of this information up on, on the website as well. Our floor finishes have um, a specific product as well that provide a protection for the duration of that finish. We have hospital grade BP misters and electrostatic sprayers that will be spraying, um, that will be disinfecting spaces and, and um, will be applying them to high touch areas. Every space in a school is high touch, I understand that. Um, every classroom will have a spray bottle and paper towels for, incident, for incidental cleaning in the classroom and custodians will be moving through the buildings um, getting into spaces and wiping them down throughout the day. Deep cleaning will take place after school each day, which leads, to, which I'm jumping us, you know, which I'm jumping a bit, but at the end of, to start the school year, after school activities, except for scope after child care, will not run after school. Um, we wanna bring those online as quickly as possible. Athletics by the state association are not running until at least September 21st. And if the state makes the determination that we cannot begin sports on September 21st, it's automatically moved to January. And we'll do a winter spring, a winter fall spring three season compressed year. It's not going to be maybe October 1st, maybe October 15th. Um, the state association will say it's gonna be September 21st and we'll probably know in the next few weeks whether that's happening or not. So the after school activities will be extremely limited so that the buildings can rest and that our teens can get in there and do the deep cleaning that's necessary and that we have the capacity to do. Our cleaning teams will have the appropriate PPE that includes gloves, masks, face shields as required, and then we'll have this equipment as well. Um, the questions related to ventilation. Um, our ventilation meets the regulations um, and our, we've engaged our HVAC company uh, partners to assess our systems to identify the highest level of MERV filter. So you've heard the governor talk about that. Um, it, there's a number after your MERV filter, which is essentially the, 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 the higher the number, the smaller level of microbe that it catches. Uh, we have MERV 8 filters, um, but a number of our systems can go push up to MERV 11, MERV 13, and we're, we're implementing those. 
um, and testing the other ones to see. Those older HVAC systems, as we've heard in the media, they don't necessarily, um, they can't necessarily take those high level filters. Um, but we're, we're going through those motions to put the highest level filter that the, um, the system can take. There's no regulation on what it should be. So we're just aspiring to do the best that we can. The best, um, the best antidote in terms of ventilation is fresh air flow. So our unit venters, ventilators in the classrooms and our systems do pull in fresh air. Those louvers open, and so they'll be set to maximize fresh air flow in the building. You get into a conflict with fire code and that where doors need to stay open or closed and COVID health regulations that say they need to stay open. Right now, we're going to open as much as we can to keep air flow circulating um, because that is seen as the, as, as the ideal best practice. Um, okay. Temperature taking and daily health assurances. So just to recap what, and we'll talk a little bit about return to school procedures here as well. So students and staff with a hundred degree temperature or higher and symptoms of possible COVID should not be present in school. We know that kids come to school sick. We know that it's a practical survival for families that sometimes kids come to school sick. We have to continue to encourage that if your child is sick, you have to stay home. You have to stay home until your child is symptom free for 24 hours. The symptoms of COVID are the symptoms of every ailment that we face in schools in September, October, November, and throughout the year. Fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle ache, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Could be any, could be anything. However, we have to assess these health checks every day and assess kids who are, or sta and staff who are symptomatic and then make decisions from there. So daily health screenings will um, take place for everybody. We are um, shopping a solution right now that would push out a link to families to complete that four question uh, screening every day. And we would have on our devices, we would be able to see who has or who hasn't. And then every child who hasn't, we would conduct that screening before they entered the building. Temperature checks will take place before every child enters the building and every staff member enters the building. We expect to have a solution of, of thermometers that are mounted on the wall that you put your wrist up to and it takes your temperature. That will be seen, uh, overseen by a staff member who, if there is a flag, they will discreetly take that child or staff member to an assessment space. If you've driven by the campuses since Monday, you've seen that there are trailers outside of each building. We intend for that assessment space to be outside of the building as another risk mitigation so that individuals don't enter the building if they're symptomatic. We understand and we know that a, someone may enter the building who either did not disclose that they have a symptom or, um, and so we need to be mindful of that, that if somebody is symptomatic in the, inside the building, then they'll be seen by the nurse. The nurse will come down, have all the appropriate PPE. You might develop a symptom starting at 11 o'clock in the morning. You've already been in the building. And so we'll, we'll have to address that at that point. Uh, the testing protocol, which you can find on our website, is has been developed with Stony Brook Southampton. We spent time with the president and the chief medical officer and vice president of Stony Brook yesterday. Um, if, if somebody is symptomatic, we're going, to re we're going to send them home, and in order to come back to school, they're going to need to have seen their doctor. And if they don't have a doctor, there's a number that we'll be providing them to call a doctor at Southampton Hospital. That doctor is going to assess the situation and say, Lars always has allergies at this time, or he has a condition where he has a sore throat in September. It's well documented. There's nothing else out of the blue. There's no other information that would lead me to believe that he is at risk for COVID. He hasn't been exposed to anybody, he hasn't traveled anywhere. I'm going to write a note and he can, he's going to go back to school after he's 24 hours symptom free, um, or he didn't take his Allegra or, or whatever it is. The doctor may then also say, you know what, I'm going to send you for a COVID test. Um, there's, there's an, 
no explanation for why you might have this, you know, there's a risk factor here, you're gonna go take this test. You can go to your doctor and they can arrange for the test for you at a testing location, or you can go to Southampton Hospital. You'd call the number that's on our website, we'd provide that to you. You'd register for a test, you have to make an appointment for the test, they're scheduling within 24 hours, and then you would go there to, to take that test. It would be not the saliva test, it would be uh, the test that is done through the nasal passage. Um, at that point, you would be home and you would wait for your test results. If your test results were positive for COVID-19, then you would be required to stay home for the next 10 days and being symptom free for and not having had a fever for 72 hours without fever reducers. So at the end of that 10 day period, you have, to, you have to have not had a fever for 72 hours and you have to be symptom free. Then you can come back to school. If you get a negative COVID test, you can come back to school if you're symptom free for 24 hours. At that point, if you are a positive COVID patient, then the Suffolk County Department of Health will begin contact tracing. And that will, we will work with the, with the Suffolk County contact tracing team and provide them with the bus rosters that will identify where kids sat, class rosters, when kids go to the bathroom, class lists, so that contact tracing can begin. It's quite a sophisticated operation that Suffolk County has, and then they would determine who needs to then quarantine based on being in contact with a positive individual. Being in contact means being within six feet for more than 10 minutes. So the Suffolk County Department of Health will work us through the case when there's a positive case. Contact tracing does not happen if there are, um, if there is not a positive test or it's just a symptomatic non-confirmed person. Our nurses will be trained by the Suffolk County Department of Health to conduct these health assessments so that they are consistent across the board um, so that schools are implementing uh, that as well. Um, I'm looking through uh, some of the questions as we go to see if I can capture any that are related here. Uh, student bathrooms will be utilized in a very careful way and sanitized on a regular basis. So we'll be able to identify when a, when a student went into the bathroom and then on a regular basis and every hour, every half hour, it'll come in, someone will come in and spray that bathroom down. So it will be done on a regular basis. They'll be, make sure, we'll make sure that it's stocked with soap and water and um, as well. And in most situations we'll have monitors uh, I think in all situations, we're working on the final detail of where kids will sign in, but we will have a record of who goes into the bathroom um, and then a record, a clear record of when the spaces are sanitized and cleaned as the day goes on. Okay. Oh, Mr. Farrar, you're dismissing. Very good. Okay. Um, face coverings and social distancing. So this is a question that um, comes up. Um, there's personal preference that's involved in this. There's personal comfort level that is involved in this. Uh, but the, the policy as we reopen schools will be that all individuals will wear a face covering that covers both your nose and your mouth. Um, staff members may take their face coverings off if they're in a space without students. Um, they may not choose to wear a face covering if they're alone in a space without students or they can socially distance from colleagues. That said, as I mentioned last night, you have to go the path of the most, you have to look to the person, so this is for the adults who might be watching, um, you have to go to the person who is the most committed to face coverings. And if it's two individuals sitting in a classroom and we need to, and one wants face coverings on, we need to respect that and we'll navigate that um, as we go. Mass breaks for students will be implemented at the direction of the staff member or the teacher who they're supervising. How that, how that works and what that looks like, um, we're putting the specifics behind that, but it is essentially taking your mask down and for a period of time, not 60 seconds and put it back up, but you can work right now. A fraction of the class can work for this period of time without their face covering, because remember we're still six feet apart, so we're not in that contact zone. If, if, we're, moving, if we're moving about a little bit, there won't be a mask break at that time. But if kids are sitting and working in their desk or there's a lecture taking place by the teacher in the front of the room, perhaps this 
fraction of kids can take their mask down. And then when time runs, that goes up. And then this group of kids can take their, they can have a mask break as well. Face coverings will be required in common areas. So entering and exiting the building, transitioning, going to the bathroom, um, all we will need face coverings on at that time. Any visitors to the building will have to have masks. It's going to feel weird, moms and dads and, and family members who are, are on, the, on the call tonight. It's gonna to feel weird because limit, we are going to need to limit access into the building. So popping into the building, be bopping down to the main office to see, to drop off something or to pick up something is going to be more curtailed so that the number of people coming into the building is limited. That's going to feel diff different at first. So if you're dropping off a flute or you're dropping off a, a lunch or a homework packet or, or whatever it might be, there might be a table or cubbies at the security booth and you'll drop it off with, and we'll, put the, we'll affix the child's name to it, retrieve it and get it to your child. Um, so th that's one of those specific, how is this going to actually work minute by minute? That's being finalized by our teams right now. As I mentioned, social distancing is defined as six feet um, and uh, that's individual to individual uh, to, um, with masks, as well, with face coverings as well. Food service and child nutrition. Uh, food service will be fully operational for any child who wants um, for any child who wants um, lunch or breakfast. How that looks is also being finalized right now, but will essentially look like grab and go breakfast that could be consumed in the classroom, individually in your space. In the elementary and middle school, lunch in your classroom, that'll be delivered or if students are, you know, the old school bringers. If they're bringers, they'll have their lunch, but then lunch will come to the classroom. It'll be served in clamshell, like at the deli or wrapped type situations. For the time being, there'll be no servant, hot serving line with exposed food where kids are carrying exposed trays of food. Um, for at least the start of the school year, the food, our ser food service folks will, will serve food in this manner. Um, in the high school, students will eat in the cafeteria right now uh, uh, at desks that are, that are spaced six feet apart or tables that have barriers, uh, clear plastic barriers um, that, could, that serve when social distancing cannot be achieved. On the hybrid day for those 7th through 12th graders who will spend a portion of their week learning remotely, students who uh, want food will have the opportunity to take it ninth period on the day they're in school, they'll take their breakfast and their lunch and they'll head on home and they'll have their meal for the next day. They just throw it in the fridge and that way they have it. We don't have to coordinate getting the child to school to get the meal or getting the meal to um, the student at home. Excuse me for one minute. Okay, so, you know, those are some of the operational pieces that lead us to what is going, what school and learning is going to look like for our kids. What are the benefits and challenges of a phased approach? Phasing is how New York State has done this New York forward, has done this New York restart. Prior to schools, business and in, in the industries are being phased in, sometimes slower than we want, sometimes faster than we're comfortable with, but the phase in mindset um, is one that has worked uh, here and not necessarily elsewhere in the nation, uh, but it's worked here. Um, it helps build confidence for all of our stakeholders. It allows us to test our systems at a lower capacity. Um, we are testing all of our systems right now, and we have 50 to 70 adults in the space right now. In September, we will have students, staff, faculty will be much more populated. So phasing it in slowly helps us make sure those systems are exactly what they need to be. The health and wellness of our students and staff is still unknown. Other than Ponquag Beach, you're not seeing these congregations that we're seeing, uh, that we would expect to see when we open um, schools. It will allow for additional space um, when we're working for the first couple of weeks at 50% capacity, that it helps increase our ability to move and get comfortable in the space. Um, and it avoids stretching resources thin and imploding the system. What are the challenges? It's two more weeks of juggling childcare for working families um, and supervision. 
Um, there's, a, there's a loss of face-to-face -face instructional time. Um, that's, this first start to the, the, to the year is going to require asynchronous instruction. It's going to be some review. It's going to be some filling the gaps from, from last year, refilling some slide that exists even under the best of circumstances. We understand that there's a lack of consistency between households and the support structure and resources that households have available to them. Um, and there's a, there's a delay. There's not that real-time response mechanism for students when they're not present. So we're moving as fast as we can to full in-person instruction, but slow as we must, slow as we must. We need to do it carefully so that as we open, we can remain open. So here's what I'm going to spend some time on this slide, but here's the real nuts and bolts of this. Forget the day-to-day -day the first two weeks. Pre-K through sixth grade will be in school every day. Our plan when we are up and running is that pre-K through sixth will be up every day. Third and fourth grade was that sticky wicket over the last few weeks. Last night was the first night that I think the panelists on this webinar slept well or better than they had in the past six weeks. Third and fourth grade being on the alternating day was giving us consternation. We, were, we, we didn't like it. Um, Mr. Meyer, Mr. T, the Board of Education, this leadership team right here, put a tremendous amount of time and energy and resources into getting that um, up and running. How did we do it? Adding more homerooms and driving the cluster size or the cohort size of the classroom down. I hear people cheering. I hear people saying, this still doesn't work for me. I hear people saying, I'm going to go full remote. I know we're all over the map. Every third email I get says something different about what a family needs and what a family's comfortable with. Consistently throughout it is that HB strong behind me, that HB strong mentality. So I say thank you because in it, you're, you're fully understanding that the stresses of your own household are felt across the community. It's a real shared experience here. So um, I commend you for that. I have, we have communities, you know, that we're seeing on social media that are not enjoying that same HB community spirit where we're digging in and supporting one another. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of this community. I'm certainly proud to be part of it um, in a lot of ways. So seven through 12 would be on a hybrid schedule. To start the year, we're all going to be on a hybrid schedule. The purple team is going to go to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Those designations, I see there's a question in the Q&A, when are we going to know? We're uh, going to be sending out those letters on Friday um, to let you know, so you'll get them Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, if you're on the purple team or the white team. Uh, we attempted that. There may be, the, the, we are humans, and we are doing an unprecedented task. So as letters go home, and you have two letters because you have two kids, or you're in a mother-daughter structured house and downstairs is on um, the Wednesday, Thursday schedule and you're on the Tuesday, or the Wednesday, Friday schedule and you're on the Tuesday, Thursday schedule. That was not the intention. So before worrying or panicking, just make a call to, this, to us at any of the schools because we've built the teams with the intention that households stay together. One Ponquag Avenue is either a purple team day or a white team day. Two Ponquag Avenue might be, per, might be the opposite, but we really try to not just look at last names because we know siblings may have last names, we know families may have different living arrangements where houses have multiple families with last names. So a Pagano and a Clemenson might live in the same house. We wanna make sure we're both on the purple team, if that makes sense. So those designations will come out next week. If I'm full time, why does it matter what team I'm on? Because we may be full time, but come a point in the year, we have to be prepared to go full remote. If there's a second wave, if there's an incidence of a high incidence of positive test in the community, we may go full remote and that purple and white structure, that Bayman purple and white is going to come into play again because that's how we're going to do our remote learning. Okay. So phase one. I'm calling phase zero full remote. March to June of last year was phase zero. Then we have phase one, which is the everybody's 50%. 
phase two, where some of us are 50%, some of us are 100%. Phase three, we're moving towards 100%. Based on the circumstances in the community, we can go back and forth and back and forth as we need to. We're gonna, we're gonna try not to do that at 1 p.m. on a Tuesday. We're gonna try to do that methodically, where we assess and give families notice that we're having to switch our model between the phases. Phase one, we're converting Monday, September 14th to a superintendent's conference day. It's the opportunity for the faculty and staff to have a minute and assess the four days that took place and make immediate changes that might need to be made for week two. Life skills will meet every day. We have one life skills classroom in every building. Pre-K through 12, we're gonna meet alternating day, 50% capacity. That allows us to do all the things I mentioned. Work on our protocols and teach the routines to kids. Work in small groups to get acclimated and comfortable. It, opening school for everybody on this call and throughout the community is all up here right now. It's all abstract. The first two weeks are going to be illustrating it, bringing it to life, and getting families to say, you know what, I wasn't ready for this, or hey, I'm comfortable with this. This is going to be okay. We believe it's going to be okay. And we want to bring families along and staff and faculty along to do that carefully. Phase two, September 21st, Monday, September 21st, pre-K through six, life skills in the elementary, middle, and high school, and departmental self-contained special education in the middle and the high school will go every day. Seven through 12 will be hybrid, purple team day or white team day. Purple and white groups are going to, will exist again for future shutdowns if we need to. And phase two will begin on September 21st, unless it cannot. I know that's so uncomfortable, I know. It's going to begin on September 21st, unless it can't. And we're gonna let you know that as quickly as we would know that, that we're gonna stay in a 50% hybrid if we had to. We intend to not. We intend to move to phase two on Monday, September 21st. But if circumstances, we are going to be responsive to circumstances. That is our obligation to you. It is our obligation to this, the entire school community. Phase three could begin on Monday, October 5th, but maybe not. Phase three is essentially bringing seven through 12 into school every single day. We may not be able to get there by October 5th. Maybe we will. We'll communicate that. We will be assessing on Mondays to see where we are, to say we're going to live in this another week or we're ready to go. Okay? This is a lot of questions come from this, I know. Why? How did we do this? We added homerooms and advisories. You'll read Newsday tomorrow, if it wasn't in print today that the state government will likely reduce our state aid by 20%. Everywhere we turn, we face a challenge in finances, in operations, in instruction. Everywhere we turn, we face a challenge. You will read that our budgets will be cut this year. I, Mr. Luce is, is not with us tonight, but he deserves a pat on the back if you see him, a socially distanced pat on the back if you see him. Um, he's a fisherman, so you can catch him down by the bridge. Um, over the years, the Board of Education under Mr. Um, Mr. Luce has built reserves for a rainy day. I'd say it's raining, right? So if we were able to put additional funds without asking more for the taxpayer, we have reserves to help us through this. We were able to add some teachers to drive, increase the number of classes and drive down the number of students in them. They'll remain consistent regardless of the model. So if a class has 12 students in it and we go full remote, we're gonna stay just 12 because it's easier for a teacher and families to engage with a small cohort than a large cohort, right? We're modifying schedules to limit transitions, to maximize opportunities for core instructions. We're rotating specials in a unique way. And we're continuing to sand that down and shine that up uh, for the start of the school year. Um, we'll continue to utilize available technology. We'll offer training. Mr. Carlson and Mr. Ferraro uh, in his tech world, we will be offering parent academies to learn Seesaw and 
uh, Edpuzzle and Screencastify and Nearpod and all of these, Google Meet, all of these things. Uh, springtime was triage, sustainable understanding of instructional technology and what tools your children have available to you. We're going to equip and arm you with that, with that education as well. Students who experience in-person ex instruction will attend school five days a week. Those on the hybrid model will begin in phase two attending two days a week, either Tuesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Friday. Monday will be a remote day for all. It's another risk mitigation factor. And at least in the beginning of the year, that remote day, which will be a combination of asynchronous, which means not live, asynchronous activities to fill in any gaps from the springtime instruction that might have been lost or missed or not hit to the degree it needed to be hit, and some synchronous wellness activities, mindfulness, yoga, time management, college and career planning. Um, where we wanna be innovative with some of those live sessions and kids can log into their choice of two. Um, that's our plan right now. Some of these plans that I'm talking to you about are abstract still and you say, okay, I get the concept, but what does it look like? We have tried to be very careful about saying, here's the plan, which we could have done on August 1st. And then by August 4th, we would have said, that's not the plan, this is the plan. And then on August 12th, we would have said, that's not the plan, this is the plan. That would have created a tremendous amount of confusion and frustration for both families and staff and faculty as well. So we're putting out as much as we can, as fast as we can, and, and replying to individual questions with as much specificity as we can. Um, updates to the instructional model. As I mentioned, you'll receive your purple and white team designations um, by early next week. We're all hybrid during weeks one and two. This is the question I get most. What does the remote option look like? I want to keep my child home for at least the first marking period. If you're fully remote, you can come back into the building program at the marking period, November, January, April. If you're hybrid, what does it look like? What does it look like for my kid to be home how are they gonna dial in? We don't dial in anymore, that's AOL. How are they gonna remote in? How are they gonna engage the lesson? How are they gonna get their AP class? How are they gonna get their special education services met? By early next week, if not by late this week, by Monday, we should have the real guts of what the remote instruction looks like. But the intention, we've worked with our faculty, amazing faculty, our teachers union, on board as partners to keep kids dialed in to, to instruction real time as much as possible. So in short, if your child is on the hybrid or the full remote session, they're not learn it's not education by packet. It's not education by packet, where you get something on Monday and you have to turn it in by Friday. It'll be more dynamic, it'll be more lively. I just need about 48 or 72 hours more to really color it in so I can give you what the real what the what the full plan is but those parents who have concerns about science research or AP or electives our intention and we're almost there our intention is that that's not going to be a problem that you're going to engage that curriculum you're going to have engagement with that teacher and we're going to be able to meet that objective i just need a little bit more time to give you exactly what the nuts and bolts look like from there the hybrid seven through 12 again is going to increase, is going to exist um, until we can comfortably increase capacity in all of our buildings. We'll do it as fast as we can, as slow as we must. Our purple and white team designations are gonna remain because they are going to play a role whether we're in person, remote or hybrid. And again, we, we encourage families to, uh, to have as many contingency plans as possible. Have your ABCD plans. And please know, the Board of Education is very sensitive. The leadership team is very sensitive to every decision we make ripples through the entire community fast and uncomfortably sometimes, comfortably in other times. You know, I'll make a decision or say something and I'll get five or six emails, half of them are cheering, half of them are saying, have you even thought about this and my needs? Absolutely, 
we're threading the needle carefully as best as we can um, to, to meet the needs of, of, uh, of public education for your children. Here's what it looks like laid out. And there's my graphic of the valve. Phase zero existed once upon a time, remote instruction for everybody. Phase one is 50% capacity, back and forth, back and forth. Phase two, I need to update this slide. Uh, this is an old slide. Um, we just made the decision for third and fourth grade yesterday, last night actually. Um, phase two is pre-K through six, life skills and self-contained special education in every day, seven through 12 on the purple and white hybrid. Phase three is better than that. Phase three is it's back to normal in the Hampton Bay schools, what we aspire to. We aspire to be back to normal, homecoming, community bonfire, spirit weeks, fundraisers, field trips, all of that. And we can all just look at each other and say, remember that? That was crazy. We're not there yet. We're not there yet, but we are working urgently to get there. What are our immediate next steps? So you can see I'm landing the plane here, and then I'm going to turn to the questions. Uh, and we'll work through the questions. There's a good number of them. Um, we're going to continue to operationalize this plan and put specifics to it. We're going to develop those synchronous opportunities for hybrid students and those on home, full home instruction. We will have our frequently asked questions document in both English and Spanish by Friday on the reopening webpage. When you go to hbschools.us, it's the, it's the biggest image. Click it and it takes you to all of the resources. For you, continue to figure out the questions and information you need to feel comfortable at, to go to bed at night. Utilize reopening at HB Schools for generic questions. For questions about your child and what it means for your child, go to your building. Your building principals and assistant principals are equipped to help you. They may need our support as we're operationalizing this plan, but I can't tell you what Johnny's schedule is going to look like um, because of his specific needs at Hampton Bay's high school. That has to happen at the high school. So reopening is thematic, or I don't know where to go, right? I don't know where to go, Lars. Help me, and I'll put you to the right person. Maybe it'll be me, maybe it, maybe it won't be, but I'll get you to the right person who can solve your need or address it. That's the last slide. Um, I'm going to close the slide so I can more carefully see the chat and um, and the Q and A's, and then I'm gonna work through the Q and A. Now listen, the Q and A, screen sharing has stopped. Okay, so we're back. The, tonight is not the only time to ask a question. Tonight you may go to bed and wake up tomorrow with another question. Reopening at HB Schools isn't going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We're not leaving the dock with you on it, okay? Uh, we're gonna keep answering your questions until we get to a point where you feel comfortable with making a decision. It is, may in your world be the best of bad decisions. I respect that, I understand that. It may be, this works perfectly for my family. Right now we're all in this together, right? Everywhere, we can't go to the grocery store that, the way we want to, we can't go to cowfish the way we want to, we can't do anything the way we are used to the, doing it when things were normal. So we are, so if you don't get your question fully answered tonight, we'll keep working together on it. So let me go through and um, gentlemen with me, if I, if I pitch to you, just be ready to catch the ball, okay? Will a student who starts in person and then goes full remote have any live interaction and support from their teachers? The, the, the quick answer to that is yes, that's going to be, um, uh, more fully fleshed out when we uh, finalize the plan. Mr. Ferraro. You're dismissing them, good. Okay, what will remote learning look like on the day students will be home? Uh, it, breaking news in the next 48 to 72 hours as we finalize that. Can you comment on the cleaning procedures that will take place when students change classrooms in the high school? Will students clean their own workspace? That, this is one, uh, our entire facilities department is meeting Monday morning to finalize the details of that. Um, I don't have a, a, a firm and definitive answer tonight. Every classroom will have cleaning supplies. This is really only a high school issue because the cohorting takes place in the elementary and middle school. 
Um, students who feel comfortable cleaning their own space can do that. Um, we're, go we're going to try to figure out how, I don't have, I have 46 classrooms in the high school. I don't have 46 custodians to go into every room and clean. We will be looking at our room utilization reports because not every room is used every period. So there will be situations where there's not, there are not always rooms where period two is filled as immediately after period one. So we'll, we'll, we'll operationalize that and, and provide specifics um, in short order. Is scope going on at the school? I'm gonna assume that question is scope after school childcare. Our intention is to run that. That is a parent opt-in at a parent cost Scope pre-K will be running at the high school, um, but we intend to run aftercare as well. What are the hours for school for kindergarten? Are the children going to be made to wear masks all day, even in class? How do they plan to get children to do that? Um, right now, our school hours are the traditional school hours. Um, we understand that arrival and dismissal may take additional time. So we don't want anybody running, I'm late, I gotta get into the building. We're gonna take our time. So we're gonna use the parameters of the entire school day. If we need to amend that because it's not working or we have to go to an early release schedule or a two hour delay schedule or you know, figure out what's going on there, we're, we'll make that change. We're going to be re responsive. But right now, we're go we have to start with Let's give the, the whole day, it's easier to start there and move back than it is to add another complicating factor to families on where they're, what they're doing in midday, if we're closing school midday or opening midday. Uh, right now, we're going to start with everybody, with the traditional start time to the school. We're going to leave room on the bookends to come in and leave carefully. And then kids wearing masks, we understand this is not going to be easy. Right? We can't always get kids to keep four, chair, four legs of the chair on the floor. We're going to work through it together. We have the added belt and suspenders of being in a six foot space and wearing a face covering. So it's going to be a challenge. That's not, a, I'm not going to sugarcoat that, but um, we, will hope, we will hopefully rely on parents to be building mask endurance over the next two weeks. I've seen some real clever things. You wanna go in the pool, you gotta have a mask on for 20 minutes before you do. You wanna play this video game, you can play the video game, but you have to be wearing your mask while you're doing it. Build endurance for that. Um, I would imagine mask breaks will be somewhat frequent, you know, at least one every class period. So every 40 minutes, every 35 minutes, whatever the class periods are in, the, in your space. Um, we don't intend to have face coverings up all day. Uh, we need, all of us need that to just breathe for a few minutes without a face covering. If a, if a student tests positive for COVID, Will all the students in that class need to quarantine for four days if they were exposed to that particular student? And if so, remote classes, will they be available? The, the easiest answer is if students are sent home to quarantine, remote classes will be available. The Department of Health is going to determine with us who needs to quarantine and isolate. Why does a positive COVID test only get 10 days more of isolation, but a asymptomatic or symptomatic individual who does not have a positive COVID test get 14 days. The idea is that this is not Lars's idea or Hampton Bay School's idea. This is, um, this is the guidance from, from New York State and the United States is that COVID symptoms show up two to 14 days later. If you get a test on the second day when the symptom first appears, that might not happen, but if you do, then that's two days. You might not get your results for three or four, and then 10 is 14 days where you would have been infected. If you don't have a positive test, your 14 days starts when you go home until you get a positive test, then your 10 days starts. So you can quickly see how this could turn into extended periods of time. Um, will classes be notified if a student is awaiting COVID test results or sent home with symptoms? Notice will be given, uh, we're working with the State Department, uh, the Suffolk County Department of Health and our school council on how notice will be, um, will be given out. Um, symptomatic individuals, 
it's a little bit more uncomfortable to live in this world, but symptomatic individuals, um, we will not be unless you are symptomatic. Positive tests, absolutely, because we need to let you know that there's a positive test or you come into contact with somebody who um, we believe has it and the Suffolk County Department of Health is telling us you need to, to quarantine. In a cohorted section, that's very easy to do. In a section in the high school, for example, where kids are transitioning, that's going to be more difficult and the, and the reach of an isolation or quarantine might be more far reaching than just first period geometry. How do you prevent or discourage a family that will send their children to school without disclosing they are symptomatic? We just have to keep messaging that and keep messaging that, that staying home is not just about you, it's about everybody. Um, and uh, we will react in real time if a symptomatic individual presents themselves. Um, we know that we are not eliminating risk, we are mitigating risk. We are mitigating risk. We know that an individual in society at King Cullen might have COVID in the coffee aisle with you, but they don't even know they have it. We know that we're mitigating risk. We're not eliminating risk. How long does contact tracing take? It's a great question. How long before other people are notified that they may have come into a contact? Contact tracing starts immediately from the Department of Health. So we've seen, we've seen it in a couple of anecdotal instances. Um, Contact tracing, uh, someone from the Department of Health is checking in with you almost to what somebody had described to me as like an annoying, a nagging level. They're going to contact everybody and say, here's what you need to do. This is what happened. And they're going to, they're going to direct us as to what we need to do. And they're going to direct you as to what you need to do. But contact tracing when we have a positive case is going to begin immediately because the Suffolk County Department of Health will be engaged immediately. If a student is required to stay at home to quarantine or is required to stay at home due to cold symptoms, will they be able to receive and complete daily schoolwork? Are they marked as absent if they're completing their daily work? Um, I'm going to put a pin in the app. I don't believe so, but um, you know, the, the attendance policy is going to need to be responsive to COVID to allow kids to still achieve their work and go on the remote session. So that's why that purple and white designation matters so much because we'll be taking attendance in the remote sections. So if you're remote and, there, and we have the, system, the plan for you to be remote, you're gonna have your attendance taken, whether that's by the submission of a exit ticket on the day's lesson, or you've logged into a Google Meet and the teacher identifies that you're there. So you would be marked present for that day if you're home. Uh, if you choose full remote learning, um, who will be teaching those students? More information to come uh, on that. Will there be scheduled class at times during the day? Most likely. We can answer that question right now. Most likely. Half the, half the audience, woo -hoo, half the audience, that doesn't work for me. We understand. So we'll, we'll work through those challenges as they start to present themselves. Will our children be taught with instructional learning and by that with a teacher who's accessible? Again, the answer to that is, is yes. They'll be taught, they'll have access to their certified teachers um, and the details will be forthcoming um, there. Will remote learners actually have time with the teacher they were assigned to at the end of the year? Again, the remote questions I'm gonna say forthcoming and I, and I know you want the answer today, the forthcoming in the next couple of days. Um, what will it look like? It, it's coming. If, if a student starts a school year in person and then goes full remote, will they have live interactions at any point with their teacher? Yes. And that'll be built into the plan. Um, will there be any interactions? Oh, I love the quote, new normal. We live in the new normal. Um, Uh, it's, we're scrolling, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to capture it. Um, will there be any interactions with students and teachers or videos before the first day to prepare them for the new normal? Yep, and we even got Mr. Richard to create a YouTube channel today. So we just gotta get him a selfie stick. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna show you these spaces. We're gonna show you what it looks like when you come in. We're gonna show you what the hall markings look like, the arrows. We're gonna show you what the cafeteria looks like. We're going to um, really be mindful that Everything right now is in your head. 
And that gives us angst, right? When you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it. I don't know what it's like. So we're going to um, provide those opportunities in the coming weeks. We still got our custodians doing an amazing job moving desks and moving things around. You don't need to see that. Once the plan, once it's all set, we want you to see the buildings with it lit up, clean, ready for you, decorated for the 2021 school year. We are not starting this school year like this. Oh, 2021, we're going to just get done. We are excited to start the school year. In-person, hybrid, remote. We want to be with your children. We, that is our job. We chose that career to be with your children every day. So we are going to have a great school year. We're going to have a weird school year. We're going to have a unique school year. We're going to have a new normal. Call it whatever you want. Churning waters, unprecedented times, all the COVID vocabulary you want, throw at it. But we are going to have a positive year in Hampton Bays. Your children will be happy. Your children will experience love and they will experience their teacher's care and they're going to learn and they're going to have great learning experiences. The contact tracing guidelines on the Hampton Bays website define close contact as being within six feet of an infected student for 10 minutes. How are you going to know the students being together? We're going to be asking those questions. Teachers are going to help us and to help the contact tracers say the kids were the kids were in that situation or they weren't. We're going to err on the side of caution and say, count them. Don't err on the side of, well, they probably weren't. You know, we want to err on the side of caution and be as cautious and careful as possible. Um, yeah, some of it's going to be their memory and memories fail. Humans fail. That's why we have protocols in place with uh, um, diagrams, attendance records, bathroom logs, uh, all of that information is going to be put together in a way uh, that gives the contract tracers as much information as they can. Apply it to King Cullen. I pick on poor King Cullen. Apply it to King Cullen. You might have been for 10 minutes on a line with somebody who had, who had uh, or you had it, and you were, on, uh, you were a positive case, and you were on line for 10 minutes with somebody. You might not remember them. We're mitigating risk. We're not eliminating it. We're going to get as, as comprehensive information as we can to give contact tracers as much information as they can. And then we're going to continue educating families and students on monitoring your symptoms because you may not get caught by the contact tracer because you weren't in contact, but you may show a symptom. And instantly we need to be aware of ourselves. I normally feel like this. Normally I have a tickle in my throat in August because I have allergies or I don't. And now I do. We need to be self-aware in order to identify if you're symptomatic and then call your doctor. So it's going to take diligence. It can't just be Lars. It can't just be the teacher in front of the room. It's going to take everybody assessing, reassessing, nagging your children. Do you feel okay? Let me take your temperature. And then acting with integrity to, to, be part of the solution. The solution is not going to be done to you. You are part of the solution as well. Will students, um, also concerning his time period of informing parents of a positive case. As soon as we have a positive case, we're going to inform. There's a, we want rapid tests. We absolutely do. Um, and to the extent that testing can be more rapidly conducted, uh, we want to take advantage of that because that is a, that's a risk mitigation, letting people know as quickly as possible. Will students who are in full remote option be grouped together as a whole class? I'm gonna defer the remote option um, until we release that guidance in the next day. What will the UPK program look like? Is it still in the high school? It is still in the high school. We're starting on the alternate day. Scope and Just Kids should be contacting families. They've begun that process. If they haven't reached you, it's, it, it's coming. Um, when will we be able to find out who our child's teacher is on the kindergarten level? Uh, by next week, we should have those designations. Uh, we're building additional homerooms to provide for K to four to be in school, and um, we'll get them to you as, as quickly as possible. Um, yes, there will be an information session regarding the remote plan. I don't have a date for it yet because we wanna have substantive information for you. Um, you mentioned transportation to and from school. What will BOCES busing look like? The same concept applies. Um, if your child's on the hybrid schedule, 
will they come to the school for transportation to BOCES? You're going to get high school information, specific information about that, but BOCES is running every day and you'll have transportation to BOCES, whether that's the BOCES bus picking you up at your house or you coming to school, those details are being worked out. It might be one or, I mean, it will be one or the other, right? Um, but it, it will be one or, or the other. Um, when will the plan for remote learning, how will we get that information? We're going to push information out um, via school messenger email. A number of people say they don't get those emails. Um, so if you're not getting those emails, two things. One, it might be going, three things. One, it might be going to your spam folder. You need to check that. Two, you may not have given us your email in eSchool. And three, um, your spouse might be getting it. I had two, two conversations with people saying, ah, oh, it's my husband's email or it's my wife's email. She never checks it, so I would never know. Put mine. So have that conversation to make sure your email is being checked. Those are the three reasons you might not be getting the email. We'll also be populating the reopening page on, um, school, on, the, on the website as well. Um, some people don't use Facebook. Some people are frustrated by Facebook. That is one of our means of communication. We are getting better at making sure that if it's there, it's also on the website and in a school messenger email as well. We're trying to cover communication in all three ways to prepare you, to meet you where you are. You need to be in one of those three places. Okay, that's the, that's the, the commitment we need to make to one another. Um, will students doing full remote have periodic assessments? Absolutely. Um, all assessments are being reviewed right now in, in what we're going to be conducting as a curriculum audit. Um, full period tests, particularly for those kids on hybrid, we wanna move away from that, right? Because we, we have you in school less. So we don't wanna waste that time with an assessment. There might be another opportunity. Mr. Carlson's uh, going to bed at night thinking about that. Um, that. That's his focus there, but the quick answer is yes. I saw the email re regarding remote learning. It noted that if families opt in for fully remote, they can opt back in at the end of the quarter. What's the process if they begin full-time, but it's too difficult? Can we move from full-time to fully remote? The short answer is yes. The shorter, the, short, the little bit longer answer is we want you to give it a try. Um, the reality is I know I'm not stopping you from taking your child out of school if you're uncomfortable. So uh, that's why those purple and white designations exist. So the coming back into the building, I have to restrict. I have to restrict it because the system is built in a way that protects social distancing. And if you intend to come back in, you're making the commitment for the marking period. If you intend to come back in, we're going to ask you in enough advance, with enough advance notice to where we can rebuild the schedule if we need to. We may not need to, but if we need to, we'll, we'll have advance notice of that. Um, the remote days, I'm going to, I'm just going to postpone that. I'm just going to defer that question. There's a lot of that, folks. I'm seeing them come in, you know, in real time. Remote, I'm going to defer until I can get you the real specific information. Um, let me talk about the procedural ones. If you choose the remote option by Friday and then decide in person's better, um, can you change your mind? Right now, you can change your mind. By the start of school or by the week leading to school, really probably by next week when you have all of the information, um, we need you to make a decision by next week. We asked for Friday, August 21st, for a specific reason. A good chunk of our community said, I don't care what your plan looks like, I'm not coming back. We needed to know who those people were so, so, we, got a, so we could start to get a sense for the critical mass because the remote learning option also is, is being constructed based on the volume of people who are choosing remote, right? If it's one or two kids, that's going to look different than if 30 kids on, in first grade say they're not coming back. But if one or two are, that looks very, very different. So August 21st was our first swipe at getting what we think is the critical mass, the core of who's in, who's out. We know there's gonna be some changing in the next seven days or so, and we respect that, okay? Um, my question is not about full remote. I'm fine with you deferring, but I wanna know about the hybrid days that my son will be learning from home. Um, yeah, so the hybrid days, that's also remote. So even though we're calling it something different, remote, full remote is one thing. 
hybrid days when you're home we're considering remote so we're trying to build it so that when kids are home they're getting the same thing and uh you'll know more about that in the next couple days but that's seven through that's seventh grade through twelfth grade ideally our goal is to make the experience so that on the high, on the day you're home, you're doing English math, or you're doing your whole schedule in as real time away as possible. So your schedule would look the same while you're home. No sleeping till two or three o'clock in the afternoon and just getting your packets done in the afternoon. We will have a structure for kids to follow during the day. They will have connections to teachers and um, the details of that will be colored in. So um, it's a good distinction that you make there, that hybrid and remote. But when everybody's home, they're going to be considered the same thing. Um, and we're going to try to build the program that way. What about drop off and pick up at the elementary? What's it going to look like? It's going to look careful. It's going to look slow. Um, the elementary school will push that information out to you. You're going to see those familiar, familiar yellow jackets. You're going to see Mr. T by the boat. You're going to see Mr. Meyer by the flagpole. Um, there are going to be those comforting um, traditions, uh, the mainstays. Students will get off the bus and they'll have their temperature checked. Parents will drop their children off. They'll have their temperature checked. Um, they'll be assessed by a nurse if necessary. Um, and then they'll be carefully brought to classrooms and supervised. Um, there's no more gathering in the gym with 100 kids um, because it's not possible right now. So the procedures are being worked out and they'll be communicated. Um, it's better if the buildings communicate it to each of the schools than Lars communicating it to everybody, but it will be careful, it will be slower, and, it, and in many cases it will be familiar. What are the plans to accommodate students with IEPs uh, and related services who transfer from a New York City school to Hampton Bays? Uh, Mr. Pagano, chime in if I miss anything, but students who transfer to Hampton Bays become Hampton Bays students, and they fall, and if they have a, um, if they have a uh, classification and they have an IEP, they fall under the purview of our Committee of, on Special Education now, and those services would be implemented. Mr. Pagano? Uh C correct. And they would also, um, to the maximum extent possible, get all of their services, related services, in school, in person. And that's in direct alignment with uh, state education guidance that we received. Great. Um, what will the day end pickup be like at the elementary school, our kids being released to the flagpole area? So again, uh, the details of that will come out. Um, we are not just opening the, we do not intend to just open the doors and everybody congregate. Um, if you know Mr. Meyer, you know he is methodical. He is um, very careful in everything he does under even non-challenging non-COVID circumstances. So um, rest assured the, dis the dismissal plan will be carefully staggered so that um, we're still respecting um, people's ability to socially distance. We'll be encouraging that. Um, I know you all like to connect and that's such a special and important time to connect because you're sharing experiences about your own kids' lives and what's happening at school and you're talking to some of the folks in the yellow jackets. Um, that may not be possible as, as we start the year. Um, you know, you'll be encouraged to uh, take your little one and be on your way um, so that we can continue dismissal in a careful way. Um, For remote learners, is it instructional learning with a teacher working with students? Um, I'm going to just put a pin there. Uh, they, teachers will be working with students. The specifics of that will be, um, will be outlined, of course, um, in the coming days, as they had said. Has enrollment in the district increased? That's a great question. Um, and what will the maximum class size be? So uh, lots of, lots of um, chatter swirling around anecdotally in the community and in the um, media about folks not returning to New York City, staying in their second homes, buying homes or renting homes sight unseen. We are not seeing that massive uptick that we're seeing east of the canal and in some of the smaller districts that are just west of us. Um, we have six new entrants from three families from New York City. Uh, so we're not seeing that massive, ex, you know, explosion of enrollment. Um, 
could things change tomorrow? Yes, things could change tomorrow. Could families make different decisions? They absolutely could. Um, maximum class size is determined based on um, the square footage of the classroom. So we backed into how many kids could go into a classroom by looking at, um, we have lots of painter's tape throughout the buildings, marking off our six by six dance areas that where that's where we can determine, okay, this room can have 14 children or this room can have 17 children. You're really not gonna see class sizes above 17, um, 17, 18 kids. Those are in the biggest rooms. Um, uh, but the class enrollment is determined by class size and how many kids can, we can fit in through appropriate social distancing. Um, thank you, but if they have to go back to school to purple and white teams attending A or B, is there a change to the five-day in-person model? For example, if my child attends Tuesday and Thursday, there will not be child care available on Wednesday and Thursday. No, there will not be child care um, offered. We'll, we'll try to make child care. Now that we have third and fourth grade in every day, the need for child care um, disappears. The child care option was because we had the littlest ones on an alternating day schedule for the first two weeks where everybody is on a 50% schedule. As I mentioned a, a couple of minutes earlier, um, it's an extension of two we weeks of your summer juggling for working families. I understand that's a struggle. Um, I, can I jump in for a second? Yes, yes. Listen, I think that was a follow-up question. Um, if you don't know, uh, I've been answering about 30 something questions um, through type also. So if you have questions, I think this was a follow-up question. Okay. Um, I think what you're asking is if we return to a, if we go into a closure, um, a full district closure, are we going to offer child care? And um, because of our ability with the Board of Education to open up third and fourth grade, we would retain all those sessions, all those sessions, all those sections, I should say, at 15 or 16 students, whatever they are. Um, and then we would be in a full, a full closure. I don't think there would be a child care option. Um, students would not come to school. Uh, we wouldn't go back to a, a hybrid purple and white um, attending school. I think that I think that's what you're There's trying to do. There's a full closure. Yeah. I could imagine, I can imagine, listen, if we're in a full closure, circumstances probably have gotten pretty challenging and we're back to what we experienced in March maybe. I hope we never see that. Um, but if we're in a full closure situation, um, Child Care Center of the Hamptons, Scope, lots of innovative models popped up to accommodate the need, for, particularly for essential workers and uh, healthcare workers, transportation workers, essential workers, things like that. So um, is that a possibility? I could see something like that if we're in an extended remote situation again. In the event a child tests positive for COVID, will the entire household be required to stay home for the 10-day period? This was actually a great question, one we posed to Health Commissioner Dr. Piggott. The answer is no. The answer is no unless the individuals are symptomatic or they have come in contact with the person who is COVID positive. So if that COVID positive individual, so it might be yes, because you, you might be saying to me at your computer right now, how do you live in a house and not come into contact with the sibling, right? Maybe then that answer is yes, because you've been in contact with that COVID positive individual, you should get a test. Your healthcare professional would tell you that. But if there's no symptoms and it's a mother daughter house and someone in the household has it and you haven't been in contact for whatever circumstance that might lead you to not be in contact, then you don't take an action until you become symptomatic or, or the other child becomes symptomatic. That's not a Lars answer, that's actually a Dr. Piggott answer from the Suffolk County Department of Health. Uh, will pre-K follow the same schedule for siblings in the same households? Yep, so we, were, we ran, we ran pre-K through 12. The high school took the, took the spreadsheet first, divided, purple, white, moved it to the middle, they made their adjustments to match by household, elementary and pre-K. Now again, if you get your letters, you're gonna get separate letters. You're gonna get your letters on Monday or Tuesday or Saturday, whenever, and they don't match, just call. And we're gonna, we're gonna make some adjustments. We may have made a mistake. We may have made a mistake. We're doing it fast. We're doing a, um, we're doing a, a lot of those movements, you know, and, and we're looking at addresses. So one canoe place road, 
you know, d tired eyes might've gotten captured with one old canoe place road. And so don't panic, just call us. Don't panic, that should be general. No one panic, call us because um, we're gonna do this together. As I said, the boat's not leaving anybody on the dock. We're gonna do this together as we start the school year together. Um, let's see, if we select the full remote option by Friday and then decide, I think I, I just didn't hit dismiss, I'm sorry. Um, I got that and yes, if, if there's a compelling reason that this, it's not gonna work, again, just call your school and um, we're gonna pick up the phone. We're gonna get back to you. Um, how are purple and white teams being determined? M the easiest way to start was by last name because that's mostly clean, right? A to L and to Z. If you're, if you're Clemenson, don't assume you're on purple. I'm just saying that right now. Um, we really did it that way to start the process. And then we ran another filter of addresses because Clemenson and Pagano might be cousins who live in the same house, but we would have been by last name on two different teams and we need to be on one team to respect the household designation. What if a child goes away to a different state? I'm assuming they'll have to quarantine with it. Yes, yeah, um, provisions for remote learning uh, will be provided. Please don't go to a different state. Where, please, if you can, do not. Nearly every state except the Northeast is on the quarantine list right now. Now is not the time to do a quick getaway. I, I know that in some cases it may be unavoidable. As you bring an older college sibling to James Madison in Virginia or something. But if there is an, a way you can do it, do not go to one of those states so that we can start the year. Remember, the solution is not Lars doing the solution to you, you're part of the solution and we need everybody to be rowing in the same direction there. I heard the middle school is changing to an eight period versus nine period day. Well, that means students will miss out on any particular classes. So we are moving from an eight to nine period day uh, for this year. Um, some, of the, some of the more unique um, electives may not be offered this year. Some of the core electives will be offered. Music will be offered. Music's gonna look different though. Um, we're not putting 60 kids in the band room. Um, my wife's a music teacher, so we talk about this every day. What does music look like as you sing and as you blow air into something that then expends sound? Something totally different. Um, our commitment to the arts remains um, solid. It may look different, music culture, music history, listening, um, other ways to engage the performing and uh, the performing arts. Um, and then as we can, we get into smaller group lessons or um, the six feet of social distancing for what's called super spreader experiences like band chorus PE is 12 feet. So in the high school band room, for example, the largest room in the high school, you can still only get about 13 kids. The band has 113 kids. So it's gonna look a lot different, but our commitment to that remains the same. Tutorials may be gone for some kids because of the nine period to eight period day. This is a temporary situation uh, for, for managing our reopening plan for the, ninth, for the 2021 school year. Um, if any, I'm gonna give everybody, I'm gonna say I'm landing the plane right now, but if anybody's typing, don't panic, I'll, I'll chat for an, another minute or two. So if you're typing a question, type. Reopening at HB Schools um, is still the place to go. I'm gonna post this recording in the next day or so. We're gonna meet with our faculty and staff tomorrow. The presentation's gonna look pretty similar. The questions will be probably more faculty and staff taken through that lens. And then Friday, there'll be another one of these presentations at 11. Um, would, you're more than welcome to join. It's gonna be the same presentation and the same conversation. Um, will outside recess still exist? An operational question that as quickly as we can get to outdoor recess, we will. Um, let me talk to you about my imagination, how that would look. Maybe it won't happen at lunch, but maybe the teacher will have the opportunity to take their, child, their students outside during a lesson and, and get some free space, get go to the community garden, move around. We probably won't be using the playground right away, um, but the fields are gorgeous, the fields are spacious, and um, but we want kids to be outside. 
uh, particularly in the, in, you know, in the shoulder months, it's gorgeous out here. We want to be able to be outside. Fresh air is the best antidote. Um, and it may happen staggered throughout the day. Um, but that's going to be a Mr. Meyer, a Mr. Shug, and even a Mr. Richard um, uh, operational question that they're working on right now, seven days a week. So I am grateful. Um, I'm unsure if you answered this question. Will incoming fifth attended orientation? Uh, we will have an orientation opportunity. It might be virtual to begin with. Um, I didn't answer it directly, but it, there'll be those videos. There'll be um, those opportunities to um, engage a little bit about what fifth grade is going to look like. Don't forget that fifth grade is on a hybrid for the first two weeks. So you may only have eight or nine kids in a, or, or 10 or 11 kids in a cohort together. So instantly on day one, that's almost an orientation, right? So we can, ori we can have that be a component of orientation as well. We're not going to be using lockers in the middle or the high school to start the year. Um, they're on top of each other. They're literally on top of each other. Um, there are the high, some of the highest touch surfaces. So we will be looking to um, send as much material home as we can for it to stay home and minimize material coming back and forth into the building. Um, and teachers will be in, are, are working that out in their minds right now. Um, we've, every teacher is a first year teacher this year. Have you seen that? Um, everybody's reworking every protocol. Um, and that question was asked by a teacher, so I know you're doing that too in, in your district. Um, that we're really just trying to figure that out, right? That um, uh, what's it going to look like, but we're not going to use lockers. Fifth graders have desks, the traditional desks, so those spaces are their spaces. No one else will be going into them. Um, and then we'll, we'll make provisions for coats and things like that as we need to when it's time to wear coats. Um, Super appreciative of the dialogue. Um, I'm most appreciative of the idea that um, we are HB. I don't consider those cliches. And I'm so proud when I drive around the community and I see those decals um, from that fundraiser that was done. Um, you guys raised about $1,500 for families uh, to support families and make sure that kids uh, get some we fill some gaps for kids. So that was, that was an amazing thing, but it's, it's symptomatic to use a negative word. It's symptomatic of the strength of this community. We're working together. We're asking questions coming from a positive place, not a skeptical place. Um, you're giving each other the benefit of the doubt. You're giving our faculty and staff the benefit of the doubt um, as we answer these questions. And we may not have the answers every moment. Um, I had a lot of answers today. I punted on a few. The three gentlemen here with me um, often have better answers and faster answers than I do. Um, I just get the, the easy job of being the speaker. Um, and when we don't have an answer, we'll get it and we'll figure it out and we'll think, we'll think through. We know there's going to be things that present to us in the next 10, 15 days on September 8th and September 9th. We're going to adapt and overcome. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate you. Use reopening at HB schools for those general thematic questions. Go to your building, uh, to, to your principals. If you have a question about your child, we're going to push out remote as soon as we have it. And if you don't know where to go, you have a question, which way do I go? Reopening is your best place. We'll get you to the right place. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and get those last beach days in while you can. Enjoy your families. Thanks, everybody.